Yeah. All right. So what we're going to cover today is a common presentation that we oftentimes see in the clinic, which is the upper quadrant dysfunction. What I mean by that is we often see patients that come in with referrals for shoulder pain. Rather than a common referral for shoulder pain, they'll also grab here. And that immediately should make us start thinking we might be dealing with cervical dysfunction. And these presentations often come in with some myofascial issues in the upper trap and levator, facilitated uh, posterior rotator cuff, and they tend to have almost pseudo impingement like symptoms. But uh, this is just going to be a demonstration of a common treatment technique for that patient that probably is coming in with posterior shoulder pain, impingement type symptoms, and then upper trap pain. They probably have had a history of either a disc herniation in the past or intermittent mechanical pain in the neck. So most of the time, the neck is the least of their worries. They come in, they may even be asymptomatic. So we've seen in the literature that latent trigger points and active trigger points can affect the scapula humeral rhythm. And once you have the referral in through here, you start thinking there's a lot that can refer there. So it's not just a matter of treating the myofascial structures there, which posterior superior serratus, levator, upper trap. You also have cervical facets, uncovertebral joints, disc herniations, internal disc disruptions. There's a lot that can refer here. So this is just a piece of the puzzle in your overall management of the patient. And we're just going to demonstrate dry needling today for the infraspinatus, upper trapezius, levator scapulae, and then multipetus at C5-6, which oftentimes with that history of discogenic pain will be found to have multipetous atrophy. So to start with, we're gonna, we've identified already bony landmarks of the uh, scapula here. And in a younger patient like this, there, there's not a lot of worry. You, you obviously want to identify the bony landmarks so that you don't miss the scapula and potentially cause a pneumothorax. Older patients that might have osteopenia, osteoporosis, they may have fenestrations within the scapula, so certainly you want to advance the needle a little bit slower than what you would in somebody that's, that's a little bit younger. So a flat palpation, identify the target tissue that's in dysfunction, insert the needle. Now there's different techniques that you can use. Traditionally, and got a little twitch response there, what you'll see people do is either variation on the, the sparrow pecking or the pistoning, which your goal is to elicit the twitch response, or twisting. Now there are some holes in the literature right now in terms of how long to leave the needle in. Uh, some people elicit the twitch response and take it out. Other people leave it in anywhere from 30 seconds, upwards of 15, 20 minutes. So there are some gaps in the literature right now. Uh, but uh, according to Travell and Simons, their goal was to deactivate the trigger point by eliciting that twitch response. Once you've elicited that twitch response, you can remove the needle and you'll be done with that one. Moving on to the upper trap. The main concern here is you never want to take an inferior vector. The apical lobe of the lung oftentimes rises quite superior and again, caution with this is creating a pneumothorax. So with him in the prone position, grab as much of the meat of the upper trapezius as you can and then the angle that you're going to be taking is is superior and anterior you always want to be going superior uh, to avoid potentially penetrating the lung and again got a little twitch response there and again piston the needle until it twitches stop again you could twist or leave in leave it in for several minutes Now for the levator, one of the, there's various positions that we can do it in, but for this case, we want to minimize the amount of rolling around that he'll do. So to accentuate the scapula, have it wing up, let's have him place his hand behind his back, relax the elbow down. And this is oftentimes one of the dysfunctions that you'll see. Rather than a uniform winging of the shoulder blade, the inferior angle is quite prominent with myofascial tightness in through the upper trap, and particularly the levator, superior angle is not nearly as prominent. So this makes it a little bit easier to either grasp it up and away from the costal cage, or with him, his superior angle is quite prominent. You can actually angle towards the superior angle of the scapula on this. 
staying parallel with the rib cage. And again, piston or twist. You can relax the arm. And then last but not least on this one, again, a lot of times we find patients that have that intermittent history of neck pain, suggestions of, of past discal injuries. With palpation, we find multifidus atrophy, inhibition. And so with some of these treatments that we've already done, infraspinatus, upper trapezius, levator, we're trying to inhibit the facilitated tone. But on the flip side, you can also facilitate an inhibited muscle. And we know with mechanical neck pain, multifidus, anterior structures are going to be inhibited. And you can see with him, he's got a nice prominent crease already right at C5-6. And so identifying the spinous process, we want to go down to the lamina so that we ensure that we're hitting the, the deep fibers of the multifidus. So coming just laterally off the spinous process, we're taking a slightly medial, slightly inferior angle. And the goal is to go down to, to lamina. And again, twisting and pistoning to try to facilitate that twitch response. Now this is just an example of one of the treatments that you would commonly see with this presentation. It's certainly not to suggest that dry needling is the only thing. It's simply a, a manual therapy tool that we address all of their dysfunctions that can get them to the point where we've restored normal scapular humor rhythm, normal articular mobility with our mobilizations, manipulations, and then ultimately get them to the point where we've restored normal motor control and eventually get them to the point where they're symptom free.